Hey, Sasha, thanks for joining me, friend. Hey, Tashin, thanks for having me. So you're joining from Peru, yes? How has that been for you? That is correct. Um, it's been good. For the past two weeks, I was on honeymoon with my wife. Um, she's now in a different part of the country um, for fun reasons that I cannot disclose. And I am in Lima, mostly just hanging out and like eating ceviche and occasionally getting some work done. Okay, terrific. Well, that sounds like a wonderful honeymoon. Um, so if you wouldn't mind sharing, maybe just to start, you could tell us about yourself and sort of what your story is and how you came to be, you know, who you are today, writing, doing writing, coaching, that sort of stuff. Just big picture your life story as much as you'd like to share at whatever length. Man, that's a tough one. So, I mean, the like present picture of my life isn't particularly complicated or difficult to lay out. I'm 33. I live in LA. I have a writing coaching business wherein I help people express themselves, whether that's like helping them write content for their company or helping them bear their soul to the world. Um, it is a job I really enjoy. Um, I'm like purportedly a writer. Uh, I write a bunch on my Substack, and I've written for tons of publications, large and small. And I have a published memoir about my years as a dysfunctional uh, chess player. That's the basics. How I arrived at that feels like it's both like too grand and too tedious to explain, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Sure. Um, I think the basic story of my life is I was like a miserable, mentally ill, uh, aspiring artist for a long time. And then I uh, found a good medication and self-care regime and learned to relax and like started pursuing things in a more reasonable way. Not totally reasonable, but more reasonable. And, and here I am. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's always been interesting to, you know, read in your book or hear you allude to like past struggles with mental illness, just because, you know, I've only known you for, I don't know, maybe six months at this point, and you've just always been, you had, had your stuff together. So uh, it's happy. I'm happy you found what you needed to. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to ask about is, um, you know, I, I read your book, uh, our mutual friend Jane gave it to me for my birthday and really enjoyed reading it. And, uh, Thanks again for that, Jane. Wonderful gift. And uh, I, I don't know, it's just such a um, well done book. And I am really curious and pretty particular to hear about like kind of the behind the scenes of what publishing a book involves and what the process of that was for like for you since, you know, I've, I've self published a few books, but that's that's a totally different process than, you know, going with a publisher and would just love to hear what that was like for you. Sure. Um... So I think the biggest difference, and this is something that is like totally obvious to both of us, but I think is not obvious to a lot of people, is that going with a publisher of any size makes the process a lot more collaborative, um, which has positives and negatives, right? The positives are that um, other people take care of you and you don't have to do everything yourself. The negatives are you lose some control and the process is sort of lengthened. So the way the book came about was I was obsessed with chess, is what the book was about, and my career was going rather well. And so my agent said, hey, it's about time for you to write a book. And I said, I came up with a proposal that was about you know how I was like sad. And I came up with some proposals um, that were related because I had sort of written essays about my um, sad early life to that point, that was what had earned me some limited acclaim. And so the straightforward path was to write a sensitive memoir about my coming of age or whatever. But those didn't really come together. My heart wasn't in it. And then at some point I said to my agent, you know, I'm having trouble with all this stuff because I'm, I'm really just playing chess all the time. And she was like, well, then you should write a chess book, obviously. And then I was like, can you sell something like that? And she was like, I don't know, maybe let's try it. And it worked out. And I mean, I feel like summing up the life of writing a book like that is a bit like summing up a relationship. Like there are so many phases 
and so many changes in like self image and how I thought of the process that it's difficult to sum up. Um, I mean, like there were times writing the book when I was just like sick on a hotel room floor in India, wondering what the fuck I was doing. And then there were times when I felt like God was speaking through me and my fingers could only produce spun gold that would earn me the acclaim of you and Jane and every other smart, attractive person on the face of the <laughs> earth. Right. And like, you know, there's the period when you're writing the first draft, when you just feel magical and alive and, and the problem seems so tractable. And then there's this other part where everyone goes insane, where you finish the book and there's like two months like after you finish and before it's printed where you literally can't do anything about the fate of the most important artistic project in your life. Um, I mean, you can like publicize yourself on Twitter or whatever, but you can't. The thing is going to be whatever it's going to be. I don't know. That's just a brain dump. Like, do you, do you want to elaborate on the question? Is there anything more specific you'd like to know? Yeah, um, I, you said that like people are helping you with the process and you know you have an agent and a publishing company and of course that there's cons to that because you lose some control but like what are the kinds of things that having an agent or a publisher sort of affords you on the pro side yeah well they take care of a lot of the marketing and stuff um and i mean the biggest thing is just people to like keep you accountable and check on you to see if you're okay mm -hmm. a lot of what my editor did was like notice irregularities in my communication and call me to make sure I was doing all right. Sometimes I was, sometimes I wasn't. Um, she was really emotionally intuitive. I think this is the big difference between like a book editor and a good freelance editor you'll find on the internet. Like a good freelance editor can look at a page of your work and tell you what's wrong. A good book editor gets um, a sensitive flaky author to produce something massive without totally self-destructing, which involves some of the same skills, but also this whole other realm of emotional skills. Hmm. Um, and in some ways, an agent also does what I do sometimes for my clients, which is like identify what's special about your work because people don't really know often. I certainly didn't know like what was aesthetically interesting about my work and what my specific point of view was. And my agent did a great job of helping me understand that while also giving me some freedom to stretch my wings. Hmm. What did your agent point out about what your style was and what was unique about it? Well, apparently I'm good at um, explaining subjective states and also talking about the joy and sorrow of personal experience without seeming whiny and also talking about things that like, I'm a pretty excitable person when I like something, I find myself explaining it to other people in my head, like assembling like impromptu TED talks about like why this thing is important. And I've learned that not everyone does this. Mm -hmm. um, so like translating love into words is a thing that I enjoy and I'm good at. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those definitely came through in the book for sure. Like your love of chess, but also I think, you know, above all it was, um, like a yeah it seemed like a portrayal of what your experience was through the process of playing chess and like the different like emotional struggles that you had playing the game and um i've mentioned to you this this to you before but it like it was just very relatable to me insofar as like uh yeah with something like chess you 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 know the, the better you are the more you know how bad you are at it relative to you know, unless you're Magnus or something like that, like, you know, you're not that good. So uh, even the grandmasters probably know they're not that great compared to like, I don't know, Fisher or Magnus or something like that. Sure. I mean, um, I was just watching a, a video by my chess teacher, Ben Feingold, um, last night, and he was talking about how like, everyone is horrible at chess. It's just like, the world champion is the least horrible person. <laughs> and the next person is slightly more horrible on because the game is just too complicated. Like everyone makes blunders in retrospect seem obviously dumb, but you know, you know, like even the great, the, the formerly greatest supercomputer on earth was made to look silly by the new one 
alpha zero so you know even like stockfish which i can run on my phone if i want to beat every great chess player who's ever lived pales in comparison to the next thing so right. chess is like that it's infinitely beautiful but also totally frustrating in that complete mastery always eludes you yeah and there's a whole like territory of emotions that comes with that that i feel like you really brought out and uh yeah that was that was delightful to read um yeah, tell me about sort of similar with the the writing coaching. How did you start doing the writing coaching and what's that been like for you? That's an easier story to tell. So um, that's good. You know, the hardball question, the softball question, the alternation is key to making people feel both important, but also comfortable. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, I was making money sort of by writing content on a freelance basis which I sometimes like, but sometimes didn't like. Um, it can be good money, but then sometimes you find yourself like writing a blog about like luxury pool cleaning systems for like what ends up being 30 bucks an hour because you procrastinate endlessly and like you just hate your life. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result, like, you know, doing work you hate sort of poisons your whole life, right? So my whole life was poisoned and I was like, uh lazily and hatefully drifting through beautiful days in Los Angeles. And then to stop this, I sort of started working with a performance coach. And I never worked with someone with like coach in their job title before. And he was tremendously impactful. Chris Sparks is his name, by the way, if you're looking for a performance coach, he's excellent. Um, he's like really expensive, but for good reason, he turns people's lives around. Anyway, um, not only did he turn my life around, but I also discovered that like coaching was a thing. It was like, oh, you, you can have expertise and then put that word next to your name and then charge people for money for that expertise. And then the market will decide what your expertise is worth. While I, during my early days as a writer, I sort of assumed that I would teach writing in a university one day, but I hate writing, teaching the way it's normally done. And I hate universities and I hate having a boss. And so the idea that I could just go out there in the world and say, hey, I have skills, see if people would pay for them was incredible. I started with a friend of mine, Arie, um, who was great to work with because he's like phenomenally talented and has interesting things to say, who was stuck at an impasse. And then it proceeded from there. And it's been my full-time job since January. And it feels great. It's like a, a way to play positive sum games with my life. Like I get to watch people I help express themselves in new ways and then that becomes contagious in a different way and yeah it's a wonderful profession mm. Mm. yeah I imagine that there are some trends in the kinds of things that people come to you for have you, have you noticed anything like that and what are, what are those sort of buckets well a lot of people are hesitant to start that's just a, a huge problem. Like they just stare at their laptop and they wonder like what to do. And they, the, the blank page seems like a, a hideous monster. It's like a mirror casting all of their insecurities back at themselves. And many people get stuck there for like years um, or they like write something and then they hate themselves for it. And then they get stuck there for years. Uh, the advice I have for that kind of thing is pretty simple and shared across clients. I'm actually thinking about making like a little course about this. Um, I used to think online courses were stupid and they were all a scam and that writing school was a scam. But then I took Michael Ashcroft's Alexander Technique course and I was like, oh, uh, online courses can be minimal and super useful and um, reasonably priced. So I'm gonna do that. But on the other hand, there's that. But what's really powerful about coaching, I think, is that on the large scale, people's problems look similar, but on the small scale, people's problems can be super heterodox. Like you can have a really specific version of a problem that almost everybody has. And what's great about coaching is I can spend time with people and sort of tunnel into their specific version of some problem that's plagued humanity forever. Mm -hmm. um so the, the 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 broad trends are identifiable but the specificities are real what really matter hmm. 
What are some things that you find yourself recommending to folks pretty commonly? Um, one assignment I end up giving out frequently is like uh, writing a stupid essay. So like, so like a lot of people take themselves too seriously and um, you know, you're a big fan of like non-coercion and like non-doing as a general principle. And that applies to writing too, in that we are all sense-making creatures. It is our birthright. It's one of the things that defines us as an animal. Like it's as much a human trait as like walking upright is. Um, and, you know, it, I can ask you like, well, your, your, your relationship to your thoughts is particular, but you can ask the average person, like, what are you thinking about? And then they can miraculously produce this stream of language, even though what they're experiencing is just an undifferentiated field of qualia sorted by their current motivation and, and predispositions, right? It's not language that they're experiencing, but they can just give you language, which shows you how naturally talented everyone is at that. But people sit down at the computer and they just forget. Um, and they forget for all sorts of reasons, right? They want to be an expert. They want to be super smart. Um, they're worried that like all of humanity is going to gaze upon them and, and decide that they're stupid. But if you get people to write an essay about something silly, like, you know, their favorite pizza or something, that's a favorite thing of mine, it gets them to loosen up. And then they, they see like, oh, I, 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 if I just don't pretend I'm some like expert emitting a perfect signal that all of humanity will understand if I just like sit in my sense-making ability here and use it casually, then, you know, I'm not emitting something perfect, but I'm, I'm producing raw material that's much better than something, you know, something more self-conscious. Um, it's like, if, if you've ever tried to like walk sort of like intentionally, it's a fun exercise. It's like, direct your body through the process of walking you can't do it but if you just ask your body to work to to walk it works and i think the same thing is true of of narrative and and writing a lot of the time hmm. Hmm. are there any other things that you find yourself pretty frequently recommending um yeah i mean the most common advice in drafting is just like write faster mm -hmm. one way to um step away from the inner sensor and get yourself into that mode of uh, casual sense making is just to type at a speed that's like, you know, where, um, you know, the inner game of tennis in you know that book. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's the differentiation between like system one, which is like conscious procedural ego based and system two, which is like stuff that's just stored in your body that you can do. Um, if, if you type at a certain speed, System two needs to take over. System one just isn't fast enough. Hmm. Hmm. When did you discover that for yourself and what was the context that you found that? Um, well, I, I alluded earlier to like my misery in my early life. From the ages of 18 to 23 or so, I wanted to be like a great writer and I thought all day about being a great writer and I worked really hard um just to say I exuded a lot of effort but not much happened like it was a lot of like staring at my computer smoking a lot of cigarettes writing at a slow pace feeling bad about it having acid reflux and like you know indescribable states of agony that are like you know very memorable to me now but hard to decipher because they're so foreign and then um, I stumbled into writing an essay for a magazine a couple of years later after like a series of nervous breakdowns. I had some mental health issues and I decided to just stop writing because like obviously writing was bad for me. And then I stumbled into writing for a magazine and I was on a deadline. And instead of thinking my, of myself as like a mystical prophet, um, I started thinking of myself as just an entertainer who had to produce a product on a deadline. And that mindset shift was profound um like it gave me license to be myself to be elemental and corny and unsophisticated about it like um it it, it I, I just didn't have time to do anything other than put my actual consciousness onto the page which turned out to be like way better than what i was producing when i was wearing this like clown suit of literary insecurity yeah yeah wow 
Wow. I think that really comes through in your writing and um, both pieces that you write that are sort of longer form, but also your tweets. Like I was thinking recently, I think you're one of the most like uninhibited people on the timeline that I follow that you'll just tweet all kinds of stuff. And uh, it seems to like really portray where you're at and who you are. And it doesn't seem like there's much like censorship going on or like filtering or uh, at least that's my experience of reading your tweets. I, I don't know if you'd agree with that. Well, there's tons of censorship in my tweets. Like there's <laughs> there's lots of stuff I think about that I don't put there, but mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, everyone has to censor some part of their mental life um, because like that's just communicating with people um, and like being a social being. But I try to at least get an accurate sense of like what the bounds of self-censorship actually need to be. And I think like, the amount of stuff you have to censor is much smaller than most people imagine, especially if you're like a wacky solopreneur, right? I mean, like, I, I, I have friends who work for like KPMG and shit, and they can't tweet anything. <laughs> they, their self respect, like, um, expression is very limited. But for a lot of people, their false boundaries they're imposing, and mm -hmm. they would be, they'd have a more fun time in life if they just like tried to not have to be a different person in all segments of their life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that sort of, I, I imagine that sort of mindset is what led to, for example, you like, remember a while ago, you like live tweeted your acid trip, which I was like, most people don't, don't do that. And uh, yeah, what was, what was in your thinking behind that? Well, I have mixed feelings about live tweeting my acid trip because mm -hmm. in some ways I was trying to do something which you should not do which is recapture the past. Um, like very early in my life on Twitter, I had an acid trip. It was like a very mild acid trip. And I live tweeted it. It was back when I was living in Toronto. And it was the amount of acid where I could just walk around and think funny thoughts about things and not be like too um, discombobulated. And people loved it. And like a local curator while I was doing it like put together a playlist for it and people listened to the playlist and then like I ran into people and they tweeted about them and they tweeted back at me it was this whole like great social media fourth wall breaking experience um it was just a goofy fun time and this time I ended up taking more acid than I'd taken before and the whole thing sort of like devolved or evolved depending on how you're looking at it into a trip that was like me thinking about my motivations for live tweeting an acid trip, which had something to do with artistic expression, but also had something to do with me like wanting to present myself as this like quirky, interesting guy. And so I thought for the entire time about how to decouple my like ego or like self image management system from what I was expressing, um, which just sort of looked like me sitting in a mall in Glendale crying while mm. talking about my inner conflict with uh, my wife. Um, that was too intense to tweet about. So I ended up just tweeting like the first hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, hmm. Imagine even that's a valuable experience though, even if it was like unpleasant or uh, not what you were aiming for originally. Sure, I learned something from it. I think, um you know there are layers and layers of disinhibition and getting to know yourself and like why you're expressing yourself and i think i had never fully come to terms with the extent to which i developed my expressive ability in order to like be an interesting guy like be mm. an interesting object out there floating in the world and there's nothing wrong with that as a motivation but that also means you're sort of like dragging around this fossil of yourself and like mm -hmm. showing it to people. And you, you have this illusion that like, that's what makes you interesting or valuable. And then you're, you're always sort of tap dancing for the world. And that acid trip ended up being like a, an excavation of why I was doing the acid trip, which is related to that, obviously. Um, and so it was very productive. Just the tweeting about it wasn't particularly productive, but I'm yeah. glad that people enjoyed it. Yes. Um, people seem to like it. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think that's such an interesting, 
just examination of kind of like the internal workings of like why you would be interested in something like writing or maybe chess or you know whatever it is that is certainly not just you but i can look at my own mind and see similar things at different times so um yeah coming back to the coaching though i we talked a bit about sort of like the what you recommend to people but i'd also be curious to hear from you like how you think about coaching when you coach people like what's what's your style and how do you approach that just less you know less with the specifics of what you're coaching and more how you work with a person and how you think about that so it's evolved super rapidly um when i started coaching and i was working with people like like jane for example um i came to it with a bunch of really structured ideas about the kinds of things i would say and when i would say them because i had a bunch of like philosophies I developed over the years about various parts of the writing process and how you should think about things, which were not bad philosophies, I think. Like, I think I, that was a passable way to approach things. It helped people, but the more I did it, the more I realized that the most profound experiences in coaching were sort of unscripted. Um, because like, people don't know what their problems are. People don't even know like how to define their problems or how to think about like what a problem is for them, right? because that requires thinking about what you want to achieve and why you want to achieve it, which is something we don't think about um, ever. So, or like some people think about it a lot, but we're in the habit of just sort of like following a stereotyped conception of our life and not stepping back and like looking at like the magma underneath the crust, right? And so now I think that my primary duty as a writing coach is to get to the core of like why things are important to people and then to go from there. Now that's, so, I mean, sometimes I'm just working on like helping people write content for their business, which is fine. But I think like most of my clients, my public image isn't particularly like businessy or polished. Um, and so people come to me usually when they're not super businessy in their interests, when there's some like thing holding them back. I want to find out what that thing is. That can also be true in polished businessy contexts. Um, that's sort of a rambling answer. Hmm. So you're trying to. I never detect... talked about this out loud, and it's very important, which makes it difficult. I think. I think burrowing into the psychological life of expression for each person and finding out like what it is that's stopping them from bringing their entire self to the page is the most important thing. And then there's stuff like once you find that essence and you can get it out there, um, how can you mold it into a more graceful user experience? Because that's part of it as well, right? Like just like being totally uninhibited is a necessary first step to producing great writing, but it isn't the last step. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I'm hearing like maybe two, two big themes there that like one is you, each person has kind of a something that's like blocking them from deeper, fuller self-expression and you're trying to like figure out their psyche and like work with them to find that and move through that. And then also that you sort of over time transition from like sort of a scripted structured format to something like less structured and, and more uh, intuitive or uh, based on the actual live interaction with a specific person. Is that a fair summary of what you're saying? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, part of that was just like having faith in like my own value and what I could bring to another person's life, mm -hmm. right? Like I'd sort of productized myself in that there were like various pieces of wisdom in my brain and I thought like, okay, if I have these 10 pieces of wisdom and I deploy eight of them, then I have earned my fee. Uh -huh. And um, instead, um, I've transitioned to thinking like, okay, if I have a sincere conversation with someone about expression and I assign them some work that's meaningful, I can get a lot done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think how to ask this. Um, I'd be curious to hear you know, I did a thread a while ago of like kind of summarizing what my experience working with you was like, and uh, partly so that I could remember the things just like, cause I went through like all our emails and conversations and assignments and stuff and just wanted to kind of like 
internalized that and figured by putting it out there that would be helpful to others but the way that you're talking about this like that you're um you know like you said people don't really know what they're coming for and so i'm i would be kind of curious to like debrief what your perspective on that was and like what the experience of working with me was like from from your perspective like um both not not necessarily about me in particular but like i'm a, I'm a live person that you've worked with that you can uh feel free to talk publicly about because this is my podcast and I, i'm kind of curious what your experience of these kinds of situations is well, you were a great guy to work with. And talking about people's problems being undefined, I mean, you're the first like professional contemplative that I've worked with. <laughs> and professional contemplatives are like very, very, very good at mental inventory. It's kind of all you do, right? So um, your sense of what was going on was unusually well-defined. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there were still like surprises involved like one of your mental instincts i remember very quickly was this sense in which you like had to register your benevolent intentions on the page mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. there was a sort of attitude where you had to like you were really worried about being like a good influence on people which is good working for the benefit of all beings which is great and so you wanted to put in like in every action you did like <laughs> it was for good for a good reason and that you know you didn't think anyone was bad and you weren't leveling any criticism and one of the things i i i had fun pushing you to do that you did very well was to get you to realize that you just have a very positive vibe as a person nobody's gonna think you're some like scurrilous villain <laughs> from your writing honestly and um you can achieve another level of presence on the page when you sort of like drop that self image management layer and just like report the mm -hmm. contents of your being from moment to moment. Um, and also just like you're a great guy to work with because you're, you're fun to talk to and the things you read are interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I remember you being extremely chill, receptive and hardworking. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say that thing about image management, like, I think that's a huge problem for lots of people. Like you, you, you're really worried about people like not seeing your complete vision of yourself on the page when that's not really the point, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. I still struggle with that. Like I still occasionally realize like, oh, I'm wearing some clown suit or another when I'm writing this thing and I have to take it off. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm reflecting on it now. I think that that, like a lot of what we worked on was sort of like uh, storytelling and and memory, memoir pieces. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that tends to come up as much with sort of the more like informational pieces that I write. But I think since we we're venturing into like stories about my life that were like pretty vulnerable, I was like, oh yeah, the, the clown suit. I love that metaphor. That definitely came up. Um, so I remember being really like the way I would frame just like the intention as I remember it was that I was sort of getting in um, a comfort zone or a box of like, these are the pieces that I write on my blog. And, uh, you know, I, I think those are good. These sort of like informational how to like summary posts, but I uh, wanted to venture out of that. And um, I think, I think the thing I was like, I was impressed by many things about working with you, but the thing I was like most impressed by was, um, Oh, just like you sort of honed in on um, like ended up being three things that like were sort of missing from my writing that we could work on that were like sort of specific skills that I uh, didn't have. And you like honed in on those like in our first call, like straight away. And um, and then those ended up being like such th those like really rounded things out. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't I, I'm kind of like just curious. I mean, in general, experts are good at this sort of thing of like looking at someone and just like seeing what's missing, but um, that I was just sort of, it, fe it felt like a magic trick from my end that you were like looking at my writing and like finding these these skills and honing in on them. And um, yeah, that was masterful, I thought. Oh, cool, thanks. Um, was there a question there? Uh, it's, I mean, I don't know how you would answer it, but it's something like, how did you do that? <laughs> um, well, I, have 
read a lot of things in my life and I have feelings about them, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sort of used to, I came to this first through reading great writers in like a predatory way, trying to figure out like which of their tricks I could steal. But I sort of like unconsciously read writing sort of like analytically. And I can, I think pattern match it pretty effectively at this point. Mm -hmm. Like think, oh, it's similar to these things. It wants to be this other thing. What are the steps that are missing? Mm -hmm. and taking it from this thing to this thing. Um, also, like, I think I had a longer, it took me longer to find my, like, voice than, like, almost anyone else I know. But that process being so lengthy and miserable was kind of good in that um, I spent a long time sort of slavishly trying to imitate different people. And in doing that, I got a lot of experience in decomposing the tool sets of writers. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I sort of just said the same thing twice, but framed differently. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. And that, that was a, a lot of what we ended up doing. And I loved that you had like specific passages that you could point to so often of like multiple passages that were like, you're just demonstrating the thing. And that made it so much easier to sort of like absorb and work on the skills that uh, you were pointing to and it was a lot of fun to um, I don't know uh, like you sort of gave me these assignments of like write about this thing but it was like in the style of this and use the skill and uh, it wasn't just like for the sake of writing about the specific story but also to like practice a skill and that um, I don't know I just hadn't really had and I don't think I ever had a writing assignment like that in school and it was just like a felt like it was like at a challenge level that was like interesting and exciting to me. So um, yeah, I really appreciated that a lot. Um, awesome, yeah, I'm glad you had a good time. Um, I had a great time as well. That's the problem with writing education in general, by the way, you, you saying you never got that assignment in school because like, like writing isn't one thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's this giant set of micro skills. And I work with somebody who's a consultant in, in, in education and he says something I really like, which is like, uh, learning is simple. We just make it complicated. Mm -hmm. Like once I directed you on the path of like what you actually needed to learn, you were motivated to do it. You did it quite effectively, but teaching writing is silly in, in a general sense, like teaching writing as if it's a thing you can go and learn because everyone has different motivations for writing. Everyone has different things that they want to write. And so there are millions of little concomitant like skills that you can pick up or not pick up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that feeds into, I remember you wrote a while ago in one of your newsletters about, uh, I think it's called Bloom's Two Sigma problem. And just like kind of talking about how one-on-one -on -one education or coaching is like a lot more effective than like a classroom setting. And I would just be curious to hear you talk more about that and um, like how you, maybe like how you've discovered that in your own experience, what, what that's been like. Well, we all sort of know that classroom um, learning is just terrible. There are a few geniuses who are like amazing lecturers or amazing teachers who manage to overcome it. But I mean, even then learning is tied to motivation. And humans are very good at learning when it's tied to motivation. We want to do a thing and then we pick up all the necessary skills to do that thing. Um, in a classroom, like you're usually motivated to get a credential. And so you're just trying to like min max to find like the 80, 20, like what's the least amount of effort I can put in to go and chase this brass ring. And like great teachers in a classroom setting manage to instill a sense of community and togetherness in the room that motivates you to do something like out of love. Um, but you shouldn't have to make people fall in love with you and each other to make learning effective. Um, and I think like in an individual setting, you can operate in this feedback loop where you clarify people's motivation, help them build motivation, which allows them to harness their natural learning ability. And then you can give them little pointers in the right direction as they go along. Like it's really about like unleashing someone's natural capacity for learning and giving them the right resources to help make that happen. Um, and that involves motivation, which involves psychology, which is super personal. And so that's why one-on-one -on -one teaching is better. You can get into somebody's psychology or just Whoa. like, if not psychology, because again, you're a person with incredibly 
effectively self-managed psychology getting into like you want to know things but you don't know what you need to know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier that you worked with chris sparks and i imagine you've worked with other coaches like how have you seen that at play with the different coaches that you've worked with? like what kinds of coaches have you worked with and what has your experience being coached been like well i mean chris sparks is amazing because he is a person who can come into your life and point out the elusive obvious reason why you're not doing the work that you should be doing or like he can like find dysfunction in your life like nobody i've ever met before and he like advertises himself as a performance coach but really what he is is a like whole life perspective on work and how you do it coach um and he was just amazing in that he cultivated a very sympathetic relationship during which he could ask very challenging questions and sort of like run headlong into your basic assumptions about like life and why you're living it and what you're doing. And that was a big model for me. And I tried to build the same thing into my relationships with students. Like I mm -hmm. want them to know that like I love them and I want the best for them and that like things are safe with me and therefore I can ask some really big questions and dive into deep things without it being seen as like a personal attack, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, huh. If you don't mind sharing, what kinds of things did you work on with Chris? Well, the biggest thing was he noticed that my schedule didn't reflect my priorities and then asked me why. And that was really weird. Like, I just sort of like drew up a to-do list every day based on my like perceived obligations and then did them without thinking about like designing my life in a way that actually reflected like my passions and who I wanted to be in the world. That was a big one. Um, and also just like looking at my life as a series of systems non-judgmentally rather than like getting up and thinking, doing a bunch of things well or poorly and then getting to the end of the day and thinking, oh, I'm awesome or I'm terrible depending on how much like free will I exerted during the course of the day, thinking about my life as a system and then trying to design that system such that I would produce the appropriate behaviors at appropriate times, sort of non-judgmentally. Um, like looking at myself as like a fluid going between different containers and then thinking about how to arrange the containers rather than just being like caught up in the river and thinking, what the fuck is this river doing? <laughs> you uh -huh. know? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Huh. Um... You know, so you're you're sort of doing, it seems like from the outside, sort of two things now. You're doing writing coaching, but you also have your own writing practice. What are you aiming for with your own writing practice uh, at this time? Um, well, I think it's just like sincerity. Um, on an ongoing basis, this is something I stole from a friend of mine, Misha Globerman, who's a, a, a genius uh, facilitator and negotiations expert and um, it's a principle that he extolled that I'm also aiming for which is like trying to be as much who I am in as many different areas of my life as possible and that extends to my writing practice um, in terms of like you know there's a danger when you're writing on the internet and you're writing for an audience in like noticing what people respond to positively and trying to like make naively empirical judgments about that. Like you write something about psychedelics and you're like, oh, people like when I write about psychedelics or you write about, you know, some other thing. And then you like pattern match when I find that what people actually respond to is like sincerity and passion. And so like trying not to let the number of little hearts next to a post influence the next thing I write. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm trying to do. And do the same thing in my writing coaching as well. Trying to bring who I am on that day to that client on that day, rather than like, you know, um, like running the imitation Sasha algorithm and like producing the person that that dictates I should be. Yeah, totally, totally. What would make for, I mean, I think sincerity is a part of this, but what would make for a really good piece for you? Like if you wrote a piece 
uh, a month from now and you're like, that was excellent. This is one of the best things I've written. What would make for a really good piece for you at this time? Oh man. I mean, that's tough because one of the things you learn when you produce a lot of creative work is that you can't control other people and something that you hate other people might respond to very well. So it's like how it's very difficult to decide like what a piece of work you're satisfied with should be. Like I wrote this piece about David Foster Wallace. It was super long. It took me a month. I hated it. I begged the editor not to publish it. She published it. It won a silver national magazine award and it was like seven years ago. And I still get letters about that piece today. So like, should I be, be like satisfied with that? I don't know. It's a mystery. There are subjective writing experiences I really enjoy, but I think the most I can ask of myself is that I continue producing work and I continue trying to produce honest work and sort of like disentangle it from individual outcomes and individual experiences. Know what I mean? Um, like the, the activity of writing and writing regularly and making sure that it's honest and real to your experience is more important than like what you write, how you write it or how it's received by other people. Exactly. Like trying to keep my eye on like the process and like enjoying the process as much as I can rather than thinking like, oh, this is good, this is bad because there's only so much you can control. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. Um, if I had to press you though, say, say just imagine in this area that you did write something a month from now and you did end up really liking it. You're like, yeah, it was sincere and, and you know, you enjoyed writing it, but like, you were like, that was a good piece. Like, what would that, I, I guess part, part of the reason I wanna ask is just get a sense of what your sort of aesthetics are for writing and how you, it seems like sincerity is a huge part of that, but I, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of sincere writing and uh, sure. yeah, just say a little bit more about what would look really good to you, uh, respect, irrespective of how it's received or whatever, like, yeah. Well, there is, irreducible aesthetic satisfaction. Like when I look at a paragraph and I just think that sounds nice. So a period, a piece where there are lots of irreducible moments of aesthetic satisfaction, I think that's nice. Um, it's just sort of a pleasing like mental gustatory experience, right? Um, I like pieces of writing where I get to bring lots of different tools and different parts of my brain to the table. Um, one thing I'm doing that I've, I've really enjoyed that my followers on Twitter don't see is that I've, I'm writing a bunch of like prose poems for a, a gallery in Sweden. Um, they have shows, they show paintings and they have writing about those shows but they don't like traditional art writing, neither do I. So I just produce like wacky prose poems for them. And usually those are both like descriptive but also abstract and evocative. And I get to spend a lot of time like being really nerdy about the texture of the language which is totally different than writing on like Twitter. Um, and so I think I wouldn't say that there's like one part of my writing life that's the best. I think it's, I, I'm enjoying myself the most when I have different varieties of aesthetic satisfaction. My Twitter looks one way, my essays look a different way. Um, my art writing looks a different way and they're all reflections of different parts of my brain. Mm, I love that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I've been playing with like, different um like sort of venues for my writing recently like I do morning pages and I'm still doing sort of the like blog posts that I've written over the years and uh but I've also have these like shorter like thousand word essays that I've been writing and then of course there's Twitter and Twitter is a whole other animal and uh just like different sizes and shapes and like uh I, I totally get what you're saying of like just having that breadth of sort of your inner experience covered with different places to put your writing um, yeah, I, I am curious, you've been reflecting on this quite a bit recently in your newsletter, but just to hear more about <clears throat> what your experience writing on Twitter has been like and having an account there, like, um, yeah, what, what's that been like for you? Um, I mean, Twitter is an incredible tool if you completely disregard the way that most people use it, right? The way most people use it is they go on and they see like famous people being angry about things because they're incentivized to do that. And then they try to be like a mini version of that where they get upset about things and get into fights with people and like follow trending topics. Um, 
However, there's another way to use Twitter where you just go on there and you sort of like emanate vibes and then you cozy up to other people whose vibes you like. And then you end up like creating a genre of person around yourself, which are like, like the people who follow you and your stuff regularly. And then you make friends. And then also like that, it's a virtuous learning environment in that you get a lot of feedback and you get it very, very quickly. Um, and so like the incentives shape you and they shape you to be better at expressing whatever you habitually express. This can also be like bad in the sense that like people can get caught up in like producing a large following and then they like lean really hard into one niche and then they r realize that they, you know, hate what they're doing. But it can also be this thing where um, you like, you know, you develop an audience and the audience is united by just liking you. Mm -hmm. And that's a tremendous psychological outlet. And it's a way that I can like, you know, like refine my inner monologue on an ongoing basis. I think my Twitter feed is a better diary than my diary is, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm smiling because I'm remembering that you had a thread a while back and I'm going to paraphrase it poorly, poorly because it was, it was really captivating how you wrote it, but it, you were sort of, it, it started, I think it started with like a tweet that was like, here's how I got to 6,000 followers or something. It was like, here's my tips, you know, one of these like par sort of parodying these like thread things. And then it was like describing a uh, sort of, it was like end up being kind of a memoir piece of like your life and just like how messy and irregular and nonlinear it was to like have your your Twitter account grow over time and uh, I just thought that it was like amusing and and um, you know not not it was like I love that you were making fun of the genre of like uh, here's how you get a thousand followers or whatever um, yeah yeah it was that was interesting um, well it's 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 tough like. I have, I have real sympathy and respect for people who are very, very good at marketing themselves in a narrow way. And like, that's what they want to do. They want to be like the X thing guy. And then they want to present themselves in a way that's like super narrowly focused on the thing they want to sell or the person they want to be. But to me, that sounds like a total nightmare. Like I, I want to be someone who develops an audience and a work life that is just united around me being me to a certain extent. Um, and so that is necessarily a messy and irregular process. Uh, figuring out who you are is complicated. Expressing it is complicated. And if you're like, if you don't have like a super obvious value proposition, then you have to befriend people and befriending people is more complicated than like being a product. But over time, the results are pleasing to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be interested in hearing how you would describe what the mm, value of building an audience is because I think that's um, well one it's, it's sort of like uh, mm, almost like violates norms to talk about it or like it's like maybe a little strange to talk about it but I think there's a lot of interesting benefits to it that I think you and I are both aware of but I would be curious to hear how you would describe that and like what's underneath your thinking there? Well, I mean, for one thing, I run a business and my life is sustained on having people know who I am. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a real thing. Um, also just like making friends, having a larger pool of people in your life is, is extremely valuable. Um, I think like at this point, I've had enough tweets do well that I'm pretty decoupled from like feeling dopamine hits when the favorites are at a certain number of digits. I think it's more like, like, oh, there are more people in my life who are cool. And that's just self-evidently good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And the friends that I've found through Twitter, are just like some of the best friends that I've ever met. And uh, I think that's, that's easily my favorite part of it as well, that you just, I don't know, because there's, there's nothing about like, geographical location or even like being in a community surprisingly that would necessitate that someone's like going to be a good friend for you just because you grew up in the same place or you happen to go to the same school and you know communities are like a decent filter for that but there's also just like yeah I guess like vibing with someone's personality and and irrespective of having shared interests or something like that and Twitter is surprisingly good at like bringing those people into your life that were yeah there's shared interests but you also just enjoy spending time with them and hanging out with them. 
Oh, I think you're muted. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, totally. I uh, sorry that there's a pool next to this apartment and the like pump is really loud. So I was mm. worried that you were getting pump noises. Mm. Um, okay, cool. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, Twitter offers a huge freedom of association. And um, there's one thing that Scott Alexander wrote in his blog once, which is a phrase I've never forgotten. Something like, given infinite freedom of association, we will all find the company we deserve. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, mm, that's beautiful. Twitter gets us closer to that ideal. Um, hmm, Twitter. Developing an audience. Was that it? Have we reached the end of that subject? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know you, you mentioned um, Scott Alexander a second ago. And uh, yeah, I think you had a piece a while ago about how like a large portion of your clients really resonate with him and um, like, have read his stuff. I, I've read pretty little of his stuff, but I'm curious, that, that makes me curious just who some of the authors are that you most have admired historically. Oh man, there's so, so many and I mm -hmm. admire them all for different things. Mm -hmm. It's hard to break it down. Sure. Um, yeah, just some I of mean, them. Like, sure. My pro style has been influenced by a whole bunch of people. I mean, like David Foster Wallace was a big early formative influence. Um, John Jeremiah Sullivan is another wonderful journalist um, uh, who, who I admire. I mean, David Foster Wallace wasn't really a journalist, but John Jeremiah Sullivan is, and he's fantastic. Um, lots and lots of poets. I mean, like Sylvia Plath, John Ashbery. Um, uh, another early one who blew my mind was like James Baldwin. I think like people have captivated me over the years are people who are not afraid um, of like being purple occasionally or being extravagant about their language, but using it for like emotional and moral clarity, like using it to like show up rather than obfuscate, which I think is possible. Um, despite, you know, some remarks to the contrary. Um, and then there are other people who it, it impress me in the opposite direction, like impress me with their like finesse and, and their simplicity. Um, uh, learning to be understated is like, like the first half of my writing life was like learning to put my brain into the page in these like beautiful tinseled ways. And then second half of my writing life has been like learning to chill out about that a little bit and learning like the benefits of understatement in certain situations. Um, the person who's been most educational for me in that respect was is, is a, a journalist named Peter Hessler. He's like a freak of nature. I think he's one of the most special writers of our time for reasons I could talk your ear off about. But um, one thing is he can just like render a human experience for you in ways that are like deceptively simple. Like it seems simple, but then you walk away from a piece being like, oh, I understand what it's like to be a garbage collector in Egypt right now, which mm. is an amazing magic trick. Mm. Mm. Interesting. So, so earlier in your career, you were trying to like develop your flair as a writer and just be able to write really beautiful things. And it seems like in the transition to being understated, you're like, those are all skills that you can deploy when it's useful, but you like just want to be simple and earnest and like unvarnished when it's not necessary to deploy those. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, or to like disaggregate the like the the purposes, the like uses of being beautiful from the desire to be beautiful for its own sake, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, understanding that simplicity is powerful, so is fancy metaphors and understanding why you're doing a given thing rather than just tending towards like writing that seems like an aesthetically captivating object because that's your like value. I guess placing value in like the matters of the heart rather than matters of the dictionary, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm reminded of like with those like three skills or so that we ended up working on, you were like, this skill is useful in this kind of a situation. And like, for example, um, we worked on metaphors and you were like, these are useful for uh, conveying uh, like mind states that people might not otherwise have been exposed to, which was sort of useful for conveying different experiences, meditation. And um, yeah, I think maybe I'd touched on that previously, 
in previous writing classes or something like that but it was just so it was like consistently a feature of what we worked on that like these um rhetorical skills are something that can be deployed with a purpose and not just i mean like of course they're beautiful and and compelling and so on but it's like for the sake of something bigger with a piece and like what rhetorical devices would help convey a piece like both more effectively and accurately but also you said like what would delight the reader what would delight the reader that's one of the things that's really stayed with me of like what rhetorical flourishes or skills would be in service of yeah of course this being conveyed accurately but also like in a beautiful way that's delightful to read yeah i mean you've got a very hard task as a writer right like you your expertise is in matters of like consciousness and like morality and the heart which are all things that are like super important really profound um and very boring to write about and like typically right the way people write about these things is boring it's very hard to put into words and so i think helping you with your metaphorical skill like is really gratifying because i want you to be able to promote the things you want to promote in the world and i want them to be fun to read about um yeah, and implicit in there is something that you you remarked a couple of times, that, which is just that, like you said, most spiritual writing is boring and dreadful to read, and uh, that there's just um, oh, I don't know that you put it quite this way, but there's a lot of room for something to be much better to and what more enjoyable to read, and and therefore like more inspiring and more useful and so on as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Alan Watts once wrote about himself that he's like a spiritual entertainer and i think like there 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 could be a lot more spiritual entertainers in the world mm. yeah i think that is a really interesting description both for him and yeah it's an interesting frame to put on what i'm doing i mean i've mentioned this before on the podcast but like and elsewhere but i'm acutely aware of uh the limitations of my own practice and like you know of course one of the like uh uh, questions in vogue in contemporary Buddhist circles, at least, is like, are you enlightened? And who's enlightened? And who's not enlightened? I'm like, oh, definitely not. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but that's not me. And but then there's still something really useful and beautiful to convey about the experiences I have had. And like, yeah, um, even if they're, oh, I don't know. Like one of the pieces I wrote with you was just about how miserable meditation is and how hard it is, and uh, like some excruciating experiences I had. And I think there's a value to sharing that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, are there any examples of spiritual writing that you do really like that sort of uh, defy the, the trend of them being dry and awful? Well, Alan Watts is cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I have like mixed feelings about Brad Warner. I'm sure mm -hmm. you know the, the hardcore Zen guy mm -hmm. um, because he is an entertaining and good writer at the same time, like his dogmatism about what, like how good Zen is combined with like very like strident, um, basically like I, I got into the Zen literature and it did bad things to my mental health for a long period of time. Mm. And so I have, I have mixed feelings about um, his work, which I would say to his face. I mean, I admire him a lot. And I think that hardcore meditation, maybe specifically of the kind of like, you know, very focused Zen variety is like, can be quite bad for some people. Um, yeah, and maybe even, I mean, I don't know, this is a, a conjecture, but uh, which is something I'm always loath to do, but it's my podcast. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say like, categorically and for culturally for us, like, I think if you look at Zen, um, you know, developed in, yeah, of course, some people say originally India, but, you know, most prominently China and then Japan and Korea. And I mean, those cultures are just very different than contemporary modern Western cultures. And I think, although there's like extremely powerful psychotechnologies in Zen, which have certainly helped me personally, to the extent that I've been exposed to them, it's like, culturally, I think they're, maybe, maybe I would even go so far as to say like a mismatch for us, uh, for like most people. Um, you know, I think there's like maybe 10 or 20% of people in the culture for who it's like going to be a really good fit. And if they go to Zen, it's like, you know, a fish in water and so on. But I was not a fish in water to, I, I didn't do Zen training, but my teacher did. And so 
um, I think that there's there's an argument to be made that there's there's like a cultural mismatch there. Yeah. Say more about that. That's super interesting to me. I know you're like supposedly interviewing me, but uh -huh. um, yeah, I know we can transition. It's good. Um, I mean, for one thing, I mean, I want, so I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not Japanese. I'm not Chinese. I'm not Korean. I've been to Japan and Korea, but I'm, I'm no, by, by no means an expert on their culture. In fact, that's part of it. It's like, I wouldn't know what it was like to be Chinese or to be Japanese or Korean. And there, I know that there are just like intricacies of those cultures that I know that I don't know, um, you know, uh, the things that you hear about or are exposed to, it's like, this is very foreign to me. And um, I could say a little bit more about that, but it, it would feel almost rude because I'm not, I'm not Chinese, Japanese or Korean. And, and it's like, who am I to have an opinion about that? Um, it's obviously like, hmm. You know, like there are things that work about those cultures for those people in those times and places. And I like I think this is true of any culture that there's going to be like strengths and weaknesses and so on. And um, uh, anyway, you could look at the same things with like contemporary Western culture of like, oh, there's uh, beauty to say like individualism or things that are good about that and then downsides to that. And um, I happen to know a lot more about what it's like to grow up as like a middle-class white American in the suburbs, you know, which is a totally different way of living than like, oh, I don't know, being a samurai in medieval Japan or something, or being a farmer in medieval Japan, which I think are sort of like two of the sort of primary classes that a lot of contemporary Zen is like, was originally aimed at helping. And, um, you know, I, I'm not, being a, a middle-class American is, is just a totally different cultural milieu. So, you know, in this milieu, it's like, well, I'm, people are very online, you know, they have internet access, there's like, um, you know, I think widespread trauma, and I don't know what the trauma situation is like in, you know, medieval Japan or something like that, but most people in contemporary America, I think, have some kind of trauma background to a larger extent or lesser. There's definitely people that don't have those experiences, but um, yeah, and then like, I mean, I think psychologists could speak to this better than that, but there's like lots of symptoms that are associated with that, that you probably wouldn't see in those cultures where Zen developed. And so I think if you take the sort of um, cultural institutions that built up around Zen and around those like spiritual pedagogies that even if they work for transforming an individual human experience, it's like going to have friction in terms of cross applying it in a different culture and that for a lot of people that's going to rub them the wrong way and have uh, difficult psychological experiences resulting from that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, from what little I understand of, of Zen, one of the most important things seems to be like breaking free of narrative and like a bare regard of reality. And one thing I think is pretty self-evident about those cultures is that there's more orthodoxy, right? It's mm -hmm. like life narrative is more defined. Your place in cosmology is more refined. So it's like, it's almost like there's, there's, there's a very stable thing to disengage from, right? Mm -hmm. Would you agree with the de-emphasis on narrative stepping away from like mental contents and just looking at them as like a Zen thing? I mean, that's a, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that seems fair. I think um, there's also the other big thing I'd say is, um, and this is also quite probably overly simplistic, but the the institutions around it are designed for uh, what seems to me to be like basically collectivist cultures where there's like an emphasis on the group and the larger whole of people over the individual, whereas that's totally backwards for our culture. It's like, what is good for this individual person? And everything top to down is you know from the moment you're born is designed around you individually in a way that is just the opposite of those cultures and so mm -hmm. even even setting aside the psychotechnologies yes which i think it is like removing oneself from mental content like not thinking things like this like just the infrastructure of a monastery or those spiritual communities is those were originally like collectivist institutions for collectivist cultures and if you sort of like transplant those into an individualistic society it's like uh right, right doesn't right, right. go well 
Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I was thinking about this is that I have at times in my life been skeptical of like the idea of trauma and how it's overused, but it was sort of steel man for me by another coach I work with, um, this guy, Mark Estefanos, who is a, a genius. If you're having mm -hmm. emotional things that are difficult to resolve, go to Mark Estefanos. Anyway, um, he sort of steel man trauma for me. And trauma is just like a crack or division, right? At a certain point in your life, some way of living, some way of looking at things was optimal. You just had to like be that way. And then it caused like a split in yourself and that split stuck around. So you're still like executing on that old script or that old like emotional learning, but here you are in a totally different life. Um, you're like protecting yourself in some way or anyway. Um, and one of the things about individualist culture in our society that's so weird is there's no accurate map. There's no guidebook. We're expected to be a hundred different people. Like our culture is like by turns, like totally like censorious and self-conscious. And at the same time, supposedly focused on individual expression. Like there's like sexual freedom, but also like a bizarre variety of like sexual repression that goes along with that. All sorts of different things. And so like our culture seems like expertly focused on producing lots of like splittings and lots of different kinds of emotional learning that like rapidly become redundant in like different contexts, which we're constantly bombarded with. And so it seems to me like less likely that people will be benefited by just like stepping away from like the narrative of their reality because like it's tough to find that. You might just end up like stepping off in some like random other direction that's like a way of facilitating your ongoing emotional stuntedness, right? The kinds of meditation and, and contemplative practice that I find beneficial for me and that are, are, are ones I'm predisposed to recommend are ones that are more expansive and playful rather than saying, hey, step away from thinking you know, get into this like abstract zone are more like regard the parts of yourself with more compassion, mercy, and playfulness because there are lots of like jagged parts of you bouncing around probably because that's how individualism goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to be fair to, this is sort of bringing up that like to be fair to Zen or other projects of like importing spirituality into the western world which is an act of compassion you know uh, but like to totally. be fair to them like we're pretty messed up i'd say in, in 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 a number of dimensions i think you know we have things going for us as well but um it's it's like a hard project to do and it's uh yeah and i think i think you're right though that things like uh, I, I assume you're sort of referring to things like internal family systems or other like contemporary psychotherapeutic methods like are a, a, a really good starting place. I think actually, um, you know, I, I focus on loving kindness because I think that's a good default for people, like a, a lot of people. It's it, it's hard for, you know, some fraction of people because they have like self-loathing or, you know, other people that have hurt them in their lives. So that, that can be hard, but um, I think it's a good default. But IFS is probably an even better default as far as I'm concerned than loving kindness, or they certainly go well together. You can do them, but I think IFS is a bit harder to, um, you know, at least in my experience, I had to have a therapist and like other people that knew about it that could kind of work with me to get a sense like this is how you do it. And I had to internalize that over time. And um, whereas with loving kindness, I think you can kind of do more by yourself or with guided meditations or something like that. And you don't necessarily need the infrastructure of like working with a therapist or having a coach or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, IFS is really cool. Um, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to more of your writings on loving kindness because that's an area of like practice in my life or just an area in my life that I'd like to deepen. Um, feel like I could have more, more affections for people. I already mm -hmm. have a lot, but mm -hmm. I could have more. Um, another, there are all sorts of other things like um, lately I've been thinking a lot about archetypes and trying to use them to sculpt my psychology. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really interesting. Um, because like, I think meditating on archetypes and playing with them is sort of like a way of harnessing a social psychology that humans have um, as a species that relies on group selection, which is like we model our behavior on like paragons, mm. you know, like tribe or family, but uh, we don't really have good ones anymore because things in our lives evolve so quickly. Um, there's no definite tribe we belong to. And so, 
it it's a way of like harnessing the beautiful human trait of being able to like engage in psychological mimesis like see like okay this person structures their existence this way if i look at my existence with a similar sort of structure what would happen but it allows you to do that in a more flexible way like mm -hmm. you, can, you can anyway that's just something i'm playing with it's very early days for me experimenting with that in my own life hmm. but. what are some of the things you've tried out with that um well just coming to a day and thinking like what if I did this energy? Like thinking about thinking about myself as sort of like a like a like a character, or like taking an outside view inside mm -hmm. and thinking like if I sculpt myself in this direction, what what happens and what how do I find myself processing reality and acting differently? Mm -hmm. Um rather than governing myself based on like abstract principles, trying it based on theatrical models mm -hmm. like basically playing with alter egos on a small scale is mm -hmm. like a cool thing to do i'm finding out mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think that brings up like mm, how much like an attitude of playfulness or experimentation is so useful for all of these like inner transformational techniques whether it's meditation or psychotherapeutic stuff or just other things of like maybe because we're an individualist culture, but maybe just from being human, like it works a lot better if you adapt it to your own needs and interests and situations. And in fact, like, at least in my experience, um, there's a way in which, like, if you really do that with a technique or a method, uh, the final product as it were, or what you actually do is something that like maybe hasn't been done before or no one described to you. And they can kind of like point in a direction. This is what it might look like. Like with IFS, you'd start like saying like, oh, the, consider the mind to be multiple and there's different aspects of you. But then if you like go down the road with any of these techniques and apply it, like um, what it actually looks like for you is probably going to end up being something that's different than what's written in the instructions or what someone told you or something like that. It's, it's custom for you and your personality and that day even or that moment. Um, I don't know if that, if you've had those kinds of experiences, but. Yeah, definitely. Um, there are, there are times at which it's been really nice to tell different parts of myself, Hey, it's okay. You know, it's okay that you're, you know, all that like wounded child stuff, which is important. There are also times at which in my life, it's been important for me to tell myself to get the fuck over whatever I'm whining about and just to like do something, which is like a more like. I don't know, like patriarchal trill sergeant approach to things. Hmm. And yeah, I think it's rare that like one or two psychological tools will deal with everything for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the fact that just like, if you're living an interesting life, if you have any kind of change at all in your life, the nature of the problems that you face is going to, is going to be altered on an ongoing basis. I think this is something to returning to Zen. Like, yeah, I, again, I have a lot of, as, as you mentioned, like, you know, the effort to bring them to America is, an, is, is a compassionate act, but I think it's like orthodoxy is more applicable in orthodox cultures, mm. right? Like if there's one problem that people are consistently facing, one solution will work better. Whereas, you know, if you're facing this giant raft of novel problems as you live your life, which is, I think, a good thing to do because that, that, that I don't know, that's what living a varied life is, different problems to solve then you're going to have to expect different solutions to work differently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Cause I think that's maybe what's like, I've noticed on Twitter and in other settings that like, if people write about their introspective work and like what they're doing, that's, it almost feels like mm, maybe not quite this extreme, but almost like um, say you figure out something about you, how you're, psyche works and like what works for you. And then you write about that and you share it. It's almost like everyone else that's reading it can kind of have that level up. And there's, it's almost like the way you're talking about orthodoxy. It's not like everyone has the same problem in our culture, but it's not also like completely individualized. And there's like, it's kind of like in between. So when you take the time to like write about the progress that you've made internally, I think that does help the people like in your circles that are facing similar things and um, maybe points to, yeah, why there's such power in writing about these things. Like it's, it's, of course, there's a value to doing it for yourself, but it also can 
really help the other people that are sort of around you or adjacent to you facing similar problems? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, I'm a big believer in like a, like a salad bar approach to following advice. You, mm. you run into like all sorts of different people's experiences and anecdotes and you just try them out and see what works. And your combination will be different from somebody else's combination. I think adding to the salad bar is self-evidently good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. Uh, I love that metaphor. I think, um, yeah, I've said this recently as well, but I don't, I don't like to use the metaphor. I don't think the way that love and kindness as a salad is served very well. So it's not like, oh, that's the only thing that people should eat, but I just want to serve it slightly better than it's been served previously because it's the the bar is quite low as far as I'm concerned so yeah I mean what the fuck I mean like in the in the past I've tried to like close my eyes sit with nice posture and think like I wish x to be free from suffering mm -hmm. it just feels like inert and stupid yes. and like I don't know I don't know <laughs> there must be some better way to do this yes but I to approach that way of doing things in such a way that I understand like why I'm doing it and what it's gonna anyway so yeah i i look forward to your book yes me too me too yeah great well is there anything else that you want to mention that's sort of near any of the things that we've talked about gosh um this has been a pretty wide-ranging conversation sure has um i guess like i just want to ask you like why why is why is writing important to you? Hmm. Mm, this doesn't feel like a complete answer, but maybe just because we were just sort of talking about this, but I think um, there's sort of a dual value in one articulating to myself something that I've learned or an experience that I've had and like reflecting on it like that's valuable just for me and myself to like I don't know say, say I, have, I work with someone and like summarize what I learned from them like that's really useful it means I'm going to internalize it more and integrate it into myself more deeply um, but then also um, I want to help other people and it seems to me that if I write about the things that I write about that it will help other people I think that's that's really my favorite thing when I write a blog post or something else and someone tells me like, yeah, this really helped. Um, like I try to write, I think one of the standards that I have for my own writing, especially sort of the more like informational type pieces is like write something that I wish I had had when I started learning about this. Like, um, I don't know, I just wrote a piece about Robert Bea uh, that I was talking to you about a while ago. And like a lot of my friends were into him and at first I was like not that interested in him. And then eventually I was like much more interested in him. But even then, um, I mean, he has like hundreds and hundreds of hours of recordings on the site Dharma Seeds. And it was like a little overwhelming. Like, where do I start? And what am I getting myself into? And how do I go about it? And um, yeah, I wanted to write the guide that I wish I'd had when I started. And then hopefully that's helpful for someone else as well, that they're like, yeah, I'm interested in this guy, but I don't know where to start. And um, that's kind of the standard that I have for most of my, at least informational writing is like, yeah, one, integrate it for myself, but ideally it also helps someone that's like in a position to benefit from reading whatever I write. Cool. Yeah. Um, that's a good answer. I actually, I, I read the Robert Bay piece. And as a mm -hmm. result, I listened to one of his uh, talks last night and I enjoyed it. Um, mm -hmm. It was helpful for me because I also know some people who are interested in Robert Bea, but I approached him and I was like, he has this book with a really weird title that I think is kind of dumb. And I open it up and he starts talking about like emptiness for 10 pages. <laughs> I don't understand why. I don't understand like his importance in the canon or like yes. what he's trying to do for me. And so your piece provided some really good steerage and I, I appreciated it. Yeah. I mean, um, at the risk of over-leasing your praise, I think that there's like, if you look at um, the pieces that I've done recently, like there's, mm, like I wrote three pieces with you that were more like memoir type pieces. That's a lot of what we worked on, but we we're also building the skills and 
I have since sort of like returned to the previous style of thing that I was writing. You know, I've explored other things as well, but I wanted that to still be sort of the mainstay. And like the Rob piece is a great example of this, of like, there is no way I could have written that piece as I did without working with you, even though we didn't work on that one specifically together. Like I could have written like a piece that was just like, here's who Rob was, here's the talks that I would recommend like in the order. And that would have been a decent piece that would have been good, but like, um, and I think I wrote like a draft that was like that, that was sort of the first draft. But then I was like, yeah, I, I, this is sort of the fundamental question that I build in now, which is like, how can I delight the reader? And um, what what would really bring this to life in a way that is a, just a dry informational piece wouldn't, because I want to ideally inspire someone to say, listen to Rob's talk or to try a technique or something like that. And that's that's a that's a higher difficulty level than just like here are the talks that I would recommend, you know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, so thank you for that. I think that the writing that I do henceforth, you'll see like there was a a clear before and after. So really appreciate that. Very cool. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. It's been a really enjoyable conversation, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with folks. Okay. Yeah. Likewise. I. Uh... I hope I've been like moderately cogent. I think oh, yeah. like being in a being in a shadowy Airbnb in a foreign country, like not knowing where my coffee and meals are going to come from on my day to, on day to day basis, I feel somewhat discombobulated. So I hope that hasn't translated like too much into my uh, answers and the way I've conducted this conversation. You know, it's honestly perfect because well, one, you've been fine, but two, like I love that a theme of this is like you want to be yourself in everything that you do and. That's that's really a standard that I have with my podcast as well. Like I have an internal, it's it's technically called the Reach Truth Podcast, which is my name, Tashin, but um, uh, I, I have an internal subtitle for it, which is like just a tad awkward podcast because I'm just a tad <laughs> awkward, you know? It's like, oh, sure. I'm going to be awkward when I talk to someone and that's like who I am. So here we go. So I love that you've showed up as who you are and uh, I think we both have and that's that's what makes it real. So thank you for that. Great. I have had a great time.